Welcome, you are 14,233rd viewer of our 263rd show on this program, Think Tech Wise Human Human Architecture, which tries to uh, make us aware that our most beautiful um, natural environment here in Hawaii should be as beautiful as our built environment. And in some cases it was, and in many cases it isn't anymore. And we need this back. And that's what we keep talking about. And we think we need to widen our sometimes limiting ourselves horizon in order to do that. So we like to send us out. And in most ideal case for many, many shows we had three stars aligned, strategically positioned at three different locations, which was, as it is again, with you, DeSoto Brown, in your Bishop Museum. Hi, DeSoto. Hello, everyone. Uh, me, Martin Despang, used to be back in Germany, but I'm back with you here, too, which is good in one way, but as far as we just talked, maybe not so good. So we have our third star back, which is our tropical exotic master Ron Lindgren from his Long Beach in California. Welcome back, Ron. Hello. I'm, it's such a pleasure to be with you, Martin and DeSoto again. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for being back. And you're back in many capacities. Logistically, uh, we are have been for the last nine shows and many more to come comparing two windy cities. And the other windy city is the one of Chicago, Illinois, which is in the Midwest, and that's where you are from. Uh, but also we want to compare it, of course, to us here. And you had us blessed with uh, many of the most uh, tropical exotic buildings here. Thanks for that. But there are other buildings. Uh, they're not quite up to that pace uh, from actually that same era. Bring up the first slide for that. And that's what we promised uh, the audience last time that while this building here in downtown Honolulu um, has been converted recently into unfortunately exclusive hermetic invasive housing, we said, how could this be done better? And one way to do it better is the emerging generation at the very bottom there, the three model pictures is going uh, the, the full route uh, in um, basically recognizing that all these buildings, although some of them might wanna look as being stereotomic monolithic um, as being made out of the material that you see on their surface, but it's mostly not the case. They're mostly um, uh, domino house, Le Corbusier, uh, basically slabs on columns and they wear and are dressed with a mumu, as we like to say, because it kind of suffocates them. Uh, this one is, what did you think, uh, Ron, was it plant with? Rightly so, because it looks like from a distance. Yeah, I, I'm surprised when I first saw this un unidentified tower, I thought it was probably in Chicago because uh, it almost looked like it was uh, a brick construction. Uh, uh, DeSoto has mentioned that it's actually a, a red granite that has sort of an appearance of brick. But my biggest uh, wonder about it was how childlike the design appears in the model that you see there. Uh, you know, when you ask a kid to draw a house or even a tall house, the windows are always punched square openings right you know, into the facade. And everything that is to be a house or a tall house has a gable roof, which this does. But even more is this kind of uh, childish rendering of a stepped, uh, another stepped tower that's embossed. No, it's actually projected out from the facade of this building. It's all a very kind of juvenile sketch in my mind. It is, and, and this uh, generation of Children here is the more mature, the emerging generation of architects who basically takes that childish list off and matures and transforms it into an easy breezy building, just getting rid of that mumu. Or maybe less radical, uh, being inspired by actually the real existing top of the building that you see up there in the middle, where the architects intended to tribute to that sort of traditional declination of a high rise from the Beaux Arts, which has the base, the shaft and the crown. And here having pushed these windows back, and that's something that another student basically proposed in knocking out the glass, pushing back, give each and every uh, you know, window 
a lanai behind and then having you know pushed back a couple of peeds where the wind according to my self-study here in waikiki grant that we're broadcasting from the the wind hardly ever goes in and last time we were um, uh, referring to you ron because in the conversation we have as you also being our most loyal viewer uh after the shows um uh it reminded us of a show we've been doing uh, quite some while well actually about a year ago a little bit more and one and a half years ago when it reminded you of uh, philip johnson back at that time right you want to bring that back to our memory a little bit how uh, Philip got into that fashion a lot? Yeah, I certainly had my foray into postmodernism. And Philip Johnson had a very famous foray into postmodernism. And the, the most recognizable uh, in, to the public was the AT&T building in, uh, right in downtown New York City, which was opened in 1984. I sort of remember in 1984 because that was the same year that uh, Holly Kalani uh, Hotel opened. But uh, Johnson made kind of an inside joke here by making uh, a tower be or appear like, at least to those who had some art training or, or had loved the arts, they might recognize it. It was an enormous, exaggerated, mid 18th century Chippendale wood high, bo high boy cabinet. And those in the know would get the inside joke, the general public wouldn't, but the general public at least had a crown of a building that uh, was very active and uh, as compared to its surroundings. And the surroundings were a bunch of squarish, ordinary generic glass uh, towers with flat tops. You, you wanna add your, uh, uh, your uh, zeitgeist memory of that building, Soto? Well, I happened to visit New York City in 1984 when that building was new. And I spent time with a good friend of mine who was at that time an architecture student herself. She's now long since become a very, very uh, successful architect with her husband. And that was one of the things that she wanted to see. And from a distance, as Ron just said, it does have a little quirky top on it, which is a reference to this historic, uh, not architecture per se, but woodworking and furniture making. But down, my memory is down at the bottom where the humans actually interact with the building. I don't remember specifically what the base of it was like, but it was not inviting and it wasn't very appealing and it wasn't something you really wanted to walk into. And as I remember, there was an open space, but it was just kind of drafty, dark, uh, and again, not appealing. So yes, from a distance, you had this uh, sort of playful finish to the building, but at the level which you actually interacted with it as a human, it, I thought it was lacking. And I, yeah. I'd like to jump in too and say that uh, the, the era of Chippendale furniture in England that Philip Johnson pulled this high boy cabinet top design out of only lasted 10 years wow. in the history of art from 1850 to 1860. Wow. So in some respects, it's, uh, in fact, that was a portion of the Rococo area, era mm. in England. Yeah, and that's what happens when you don't sort of, you know, have an attitude, but you mimic a style that's about the surface and not the substance. Yeah. And it has proven to lack uh, timelessness because um, a gentleman that actually you, Ron, brought to our attention um, a sort of um, little dismissed uh, big uh, colleague of ours of yours, uh, Mr. Gensler, who passed away in upper age recently. He had a chance, I guess, just before he passed away in high age, uh, we just looked it up to actually renovate and to remodel the lobby of Philip Johnson's AT&T Tower. So, oh. you know, that is uh, what what happens. And, you know, we, we will continue to talk about that certain things need to be adapted and adjusted and brought up to current code or energy sufficiency. Uh, next slide. And by the way, not to forget, we shouldn't have even jumped in, but we're operating once again under most turbulent, turbulent and turbulent times and moments. We have Hurricane Ian plowing through Florida, as you 
uh, brought to my attention the solo because you watched it right before the show at category four to five. And we have over there, uh, you know, Nord Stream one and two being blown up and leaking. And uh, Putin has threatened with nuclear war. So there's like scary stuff going on all over the place. Um, so hard to not think about that and get distracted by that one. But getting us back to the subject matter, once we start to evolve things, uh, this project of ours where we have this several hundred year old farmhouse uh, to renovate and take out a lot of the former sod uh, brick infill and push it back and replace it with a new spatial and thermal envelope and creating these porches or lanais as we call them, as they're very familiar to us being for you, Ron, how you grew up in the Midwest and for you, DeSoto in Hawaii, where we call them lanais. Uh, the only way to do this in freaking coal Germany that we're fearing so much without Putin's oil and without Nord Streams and you name it, is to have used something that often uh, it makes it, uh, takes a long time to make it into architecture technology that's out there somewhere else. And that's in this case, I'm holding up this card here I picked this up, uh, found it somewhere. It was the local Jawine band, Rebel Soldiers, and they gave a VIP concert here. What we're introducing to you here is a little material science, which is a very important panel that is called vacuum insulation panel. And astronauts in uh, up in space would freeze to death if they wouldn't wear this material. And also we would have really bulky refrigerators if we wouldn't have this material because it can do massive insulation and in very, very uh, shallow thinness. And so by pushing back the, the facade here, you would have the cold creeping up to you above, right? And we couldn't use a foot of rock wool insulation and the ceiling would have been too low. So we use this material. Why are we saying that? Because if we can do this in Germany, uh, the student who was proposing to pushing all the windows back in that Pomo piece of cake high rise could have done that just as well versus just leaving the, the flush to the granite fixed glazing and just beefing up the AC behind, which it already had, by the way, as an office building. So how can you do this better and how has it been better and how can you achieve timelessness we uh, call you on stage once again, um, Ron, with that, and gets us back to your, your Holly Polani with the next page and uh, with the next slide. And I let you guys talk about it. Yeah, wh when, I, when I see you uh, bare chested like Putin on horseback uh, <laughs> and one of the head valets at the Holly Polani who's been there a long time, uh, you all remember the, the Cheers TV program and when you walked in, everybody knew your name. And every time I come to the Hale Kalani, I, I swear that all of the, uh, the people who greet you uh, uh, out at the front when, your car, when they uh, hand you out of your car, they, for some reason, they still remember me and all of a sudden I'm home and I'm with family again. So that, that's such a nice reminder of people who have lived, uh, in fact, have, they have worked uh, their entire careers at the Hale Klani as a place that they choose to work, even when they had other options that could have been in some ways uh, more attractive to them. Instead, they found their, their family membership at the Hale Klani so strong that they wished to stay there instead. Yeah, this gentleman next to me, his name is Terrence, and he's one of them. And it's just like the situation that, that we're showing Recording at the bottom right, these few years ago, when you both were keynote speakers at our de national Dokomomo symposium, and you returned after many years, and I witnessed that these people were saying, "Hey, I haven't seen you since '84." <laughs> wow, right? And in this case, uh, when I come back out of the water, as you spotted me also, a show called Top Right, when you were there and having a coffee in the morning, you saw that same half naked man walking by and you took that picture that we incorporated in there. So when I do this every morning, Terrence tells me the story and he told me I've been there since 83 actually, because when the, open, when the hotel opened, when he was half finished, he already started there and he said Marriott wanted him, but he didn't want Marriott. He wanted the Halikalani and he never regretted it. As you said, it's his family, 
it's your family. And there's these terms in the American academe that we call uh, evidence-based design, post-occupancy evaluation, life cycle assessment. If you have not just the hotel management, which has obviously changed over time, and we should say thank you to Peter Shandlin, who is the current one, who basically in his last remodel, uh, except the guest rooms that we were elaborating on quite a bit, everything else uh, kept in the original and including one aspect that we're worried about that we're gonna show in the next slide soon, uh, basically have kept it, but it's even more important. It's like the people in there. I mean, it's, it is just like this uh, longevity and uh, integrity uh, going on that uh, Terrence just basically says, um, you know, you are his architect. And the only time I heard that, that is very warm hearting, uh, warm hearting is in Nathaniel Kahn's uh, movie about his dad, my yeah. architect, where uh, the users of the project, like the capital in Bangladesh, they even say, oh, the architect, we don't really know. It might've been an American or so, but it doesn't matter. He's our architect and this is our building. He did it for us. So not to get this wrong, we're not having any kind of a stark textual thing going on here that, you know, here's the master coming and they all have to go to their feet and worship, right? This is a real true appreciation of a workplace that you have been provided to them that they feel it's paradise. And um, Terrence is also uh, teaching people, like he said, oh, Martin, I want to tell you about Dicky. Do you know about the Dicky roofs? And I pretend like I, I wouldn't. So there is staff that is educated sufficiently to teach people, including architectural professors. How much better could that be? P-O-E, E-B-D, L-C-A wise. Awesome. So which is that element that we were worried about that might not be brought back? Next slide, you guys tell us. Oh, the fabric, yeah. There's the, there are the fabric panels, that's right. Um, yeah, when the, when, the re, when the remodel was done recently, for quite a while, they did not reinstall the fabric that was placed on the sides of the pillars in the outdoor section. And fortunately, when uh, Ron pointed that out, and I had gone to visit to see what, it, what everything looked like, I saw that the hardware was still there for those. And so I was hopeful that they'd come back. And in fact, they have. So we can see in the recent picture with Suzanne on the left, in the distance uh, behind her, there are those fabric panels that were reestablished. And Ron, I, I think that was the work of the woman who was the interior designer. Is that right? The lighting person? And she did the lighting and the interior design. Is that right? Oh, well, first, it's, it's great news that they're hanging again. This was actually a, a sort of design joke on the part of the interior designer, who was a gentleman from Seattle. Um, and the idea was, if you want to really uh, kind of cloud the difference between indoors and outdoors, how about having outdoor uh, uh, hanging, hanging uh, material there? Uh, and uh, the material was such that it could take the rain, it could take the weather and so forth. And so that was one contribution to add a very residential soft touch of curtains hanging off of concrete columns. And a very successful one too. Um, yeah. And before the show, we actually included our exotic escapism expert, Susanna, who you said already, the soda we saw at the bottom left. Anything uh, you want to share from your exchanges, Ron, with her? Well, what I'll say there is uh, the one person that I'd even more like to see when I came to the Holly Clowney, other than Terrence, you know, Terrence is number two, Suzanne would be number one. And this, this photograph where, he, where I imagine that she's offering me a cup of uh, hot coffee out of a, an official Holly Clowney cup uh, really makes me want to come back there uh, and, and enjoy that experience again. You know, it's, it's a half a lifetime ago for me since I designed that. I'm an octogenarian now. I was 40 years old when I was commissioned to design it. And it's still my most... Uh, memorable and important piece of architecture. And if an architect even gets to have one memorable, important piece of architecture, he should consider himself very fortunate. 
And, and speaking of generational, this is really interesting about Zeit guys because extending the family, Suzanne's oldest and our third oldest together, Sammy, uh, who we also showed the project, he was just indulging and enjoying and he's sweet 16 now. And so he was just like saying, oh, it's so calm. It's so tranquil. I, this is really paradise. And only after he basically at some point started to look up and he said, oh, my God, this is huge. This is a big hotel. What are we counting? 500 rooms wrong? About? 456 originally. See, you know your numbers. So he was just like, absolutely. So usually with, I mean, talking generations, I mean, you know, this is the I mean, they walk around like zombies with their cell phones as we old fogies come complain about it. They got TikTok going on all the time with whatever it's on there, right? And I was about to say, we're listening to Snoop Dogg, who's your neighbor in Long Beach, Ron, as he once told me. But of course, Snoop Dogg is an old fart for them. So they're listening to, they're exposed to, to stuff, right? If you can get a 16 year old slash young excited about that one once again that's the best poe ebd lca that one can possibly get so congratulations on that one and yeah i yeah. agree that is very high praise and i agree with all of the everything that everybody just said and i feel exactly the same way about as i said when you walk into the grounds of the holly kulani and you walk into this sort of courtyard area which is a, a courtyard on a very large scale it is so tranquil. You've just driven down a very busy street with a lot of tra traffic and a lot of pedestrians, and you come into this area and all of that is closed out, yet you're still in the open. And it's so successful and it always has been. And so, yes, thank you, Ron, for, for creating this, which I still love to go to 40 years later as well. And uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, we'll see something that I had, Obviously, I, I thought a lot about it because I designed the hotel, but the last nine volumes of, of you're talking about skylines in Chicago and, and uh, Honolulu and uh, sort of comparing them and seeing what's good and what's not so good about them. Uh, in, in my case, I had the happy opportunity for the first time in my career not to design an object building, but to design a bunch of buildings that are in fact linked and interlinked sometimes in hidden ways, that created courtyards and, and exterior spaces. But at the same time, it created a very lively skyline of its own, very variegated. Uh, all those dicky roofs that Terrence were talking about actually occur at 18 different levels in, amongst the buildings. And you see that in this watercolor uh, rendering of the hotel that was completed about a year by, before the hotel itself opened up. Yeah, yeah and, and it's very successful. It's very successful. And, and there is something we have to correct because I keep running around and telling a story that you have to say you can't confirm. So I have to go back to your business partner, Larry Stricker, who we also going to talk about in the next slide, but not now. We stay on this one here. And that is that I obviously wrongly correctly, uh, uh, wrongly remembered, uh, obviously, uh, that I remember that Ed Killingsworth, the founding principal of the firm, who was a high modern master, and, and in that tradition, obviously, of the Gropiusian and the Mies van der Rohe uh, flat roof boxes, that we, he was uh, objected to the, uh, to the Dickey roof. But uh, before the show, you informed me that in case the opposite is the truth, right? Please share that with us and everyone. Yeah, Ed, uh, especially when he worked uh, overseas in Southeast Asia, but also overseas from California and Hawaii, always wanted to see if he could include uh, some local building uh, methods, uh, materials, and ways of planning and putting them together. So in reality, uh, when he and I first went to Hawaii and saw the Haleklani site ourselves for the first time, uh, we met the clients at the time, which is the Weyerhaeuser Lumber Company, uh, before they sold it to the Japanese. And when we got back on the plane, we looked at each other and he, he, he looked relieved because he said, Ron, what are you gonna do on that site? And left it to me. 
<laughs> so I had my two weeks to design the hotel before we had to have some drawings done uh, and, and turn around again and go back to uh, Hawaii. Now, surprisingly, during that time, although he looked over my shoulders a few time, uh, times as to what I was doing, he never made a single comment, either positive or negative, of what I was doing. And the greatest praise that he gave me was when the drawings were done, he packed them up, went to Hawaii, made a presentation to the Hawaiian Honolulu Press and the AIA chapter in Honolulu of what the Hale Kalani would be like. And that was the first time that anyone had a chance to see what the old Hale Kalani was going to be replaced by. And uh, uh, I felt miffed at first that I didn't get to make the presentation. And then I thought, wait a minute, what, what a, a, a great honor it was that Ed himself took it and did, did the selling and enjoyed the, the, uh, the process very much and came back a younger man. <laughs> wow. And being one and a half minutes before the end of the show, uh, you made our day, uh, Ron, in multiple ways. Also, because I have to go back and coach in the afternoon, the emerging generation. And I was feeling a little bad this semester because I'm asking them to do four projects for designs two, by the way intemperate and in the cold and where all this mess is going on then two, then back in the tropics them hopefully appreciating it more but again i felt like okay you know four designs in one semester might be a lot but it's not because i will go back today and we'll say you can design a 400 what 97 room hotel 56 in the most 56, sorry, uh, in, the, in the most challenging yet beautiful context in two weeks, which I learned today. So, wow. Thanks for that. <laughs> I wish every one of my that, two week but... sessions working for Killingsworth <laughs> could have been that productive. <laughs> it, the, the, the project, the site, the challenge, the opportunity was so great that somehow I rose to the challenge. And I never, I've never risen uh, that high, uh, certainly before and not after, unfortunately. Well, you you did a darn good job in fixing up the Kahala Hilton too. So don't don't downplay that. You, you've, got, you've got two masterpieces here. Uh, we saw Kapalua Bay, which stupid people tore down. So there's more. There's many more. There's the <laughs> there's the Long Beach Marriott. So there's many more. But as humble as you are, uh, we. We all see why you love this the most, and we agree. So with that, we're at the end of uh, these triumvirate back, and hope to have you back uh, next week, Ron, because we got uh, we got to talk about the Ihilani on behalf of your business partner, Larry Stricker, and more things. So hope to have us all back next week. And until then, please all stay as easy, breezy, breezy, easy as you, Ron. Bye-bye. <laughs>